welcome to City Life. Today in the programme we talk water and waste with Mark Christerton, tax refunds with the Her Businesswoman of the Year, Christchurch Arts Festival has been launched and much more. But first on the programme, Inspector Derek Erasmus. Good to have you here. Hello, good to be here. So let's look at um, crime in Christchurch post-earthquake. Okay, um, the indications are that post the earthquakes, that the, the volume of reported crime has dropped across the city. We don't have those exact figures yet, but we're getting strong indications that um, people either aren't reporting crime or there's actually been a reduction. And this matches um, the information we have from overseas that after you have um, a major disaster, um, people um, act more collegially in terms of a neighbourhood, uh, they look after each other more and you get a bit of less crime. Unfortunately, after a few months, it tends to come back. Uh, the challenge for us and the community is, is to keep it at a lower level. OK, why do you think that people aren't reporting crime? Well, it could be that they're not reporting crime or the crime is not there in the same volumes. We don't know yet. Mm. Um, it could be that people are particularly less um, inclined to come to the central station, the central police station. Mm. People might think that um, they're worrying police in a more serious time mm -hmm. with their small or minor crimes. We don't think that, but people might have that point of view. So we're still really keen for people, if, if they've been the victim of something, for them to let us know so that we can do something about it. You say crime rates are down, but what about burglaries? Burglaries um, have remained um, patchy across the city. Mm. Um, some areas uh, that are uh, the worst or badly affected by the earthquakes have had um, more problems. So if the houses are vacant, if people have moved out or they're too dangerous to live in, we're finding that people are targeting those houses, offenders are, um, looking for valuable items or taking um, copper, um, spouting or hot water cylinders. They'll take anything that's not tied down, right? Yeah, pe people um, people will try and profit from a situation from others' misfortune. Mm. So this is you know, it's a really important message to have out there to the public that um, if they've left their house, take everything if they can safely out that's valuable, or make the house look lived in. Mow, mow the lawns, uh, have a car up the drive, washing on the washing line, mm. or if there are neighbours still around, make sure that the neighbours are keeping a lookout. Mm. And if anyone sees anything suspicious, give us a call. We'll always come around and look. And are you those houses that aren't vac uh, they are vacated? Are you keeping more of a police presence in those areas? Absolutely. We've we've increased the number of police we have on patrol uh, through the day and through the night, particularly in those eastern suburbs, mm. the the Bexley, um, Sumner, Redcliffs, Avonside, those areas, especially around the river, that are badly affected, mm. where we know there are a lot of abandoned houses. We have extra patrols there. Okay. Let's look at the central city. I, you were saying earlier that you were there in the middle of the night the other night. Tell me what's going on there. Well there's a lot of um, demolition or deconstruction going on in the central city at the moment. Um, it's, it's In the middle of the night it's, um, it's a scary place to be honest. Mm. There, there's no light on, there's um, collapsed buildings, there's rubble everywhere, there's machinery everywhere. It's certainly not a place you want to be in, um, in the middle of the night. Mm. Um, so we're obviously making sure that people stay out there, stay out of there in the middle of the night. Mm. We have some very good controls to make sure we know if someone goes in there. And if someone gets in there, well, we have people looking for them very smartly. Mm. And we're, we're catching probably four to five people a week um, in the uh, red zone who shouldn't be there. And they get um, charged with an offence. So the message is stay out of the red zone because you will catch them? Well, there's two messages. First of all, it's a dangerous place. Um, if, if you're in there when there's any form of a shake, it's um, really a dangerous place to be. And secondly, um, if you're in there and you shouldn't be in there, um, you're in trouble because mm. we will find you and you will appear in court. Good. All right. Road safety at the moment. It's pretty icy out there on those roads some days. It is. Look, there's a lot of muck on the roads. There's a lot of um, silt, um, water, that sort of thing. It just makes the roads more dangerous this time of year, unfortunately, mm. especially with the effects of the earthquake. And we have a lot of roadworks going on. And you know, people are short-tempered, are frazzled because of the earthquakes. We just need to remember to... Be patient, be patient with our fellow drivers and also remember that those people who are doing the roadworks are doing it to try and increase our safety in the long term. Mm. We just have to cut them some slack and plan to take extra time across the city. Just try and be patient, which is difficult I know, mm. but just put that bit of extra effort in. What's the main focus for police in Christchurch right now? Well, the biggest issue for us is the recovery from the earthquake and providing that reassurance to the public. We've got to make sure we maintain our normal policing services 
but people, um, and like I've said, road safety, people are nervous. Um, police are no um, exception there. Mm. People are nervous. People um, want to feel reassured. So it's really important that people see a strong, stable police presence out there. Um, it's, it's a representation of the government, of the council, mm. so that they know that there is um, someone there who's um, caring and looking after for what's, what's happening. How are the police officers going? Oh, look, we, um, we have been remarkably resilient, um, which is... Um, uh, fantastic to know. Mm. A lot of police have been badly affected by the earthquake and look and obviously people, um, and I'm no different, are frazzled by the ongoing aftershocks. Mm. Everyone's the same in Canterbury but we um, we have a strong focus. Um, it's um, You could say it's this sort of emergency or the aftermath of it is why a lot of people have joined the police. It's, it's to be helpful to the public, it's to try and do the best for the community. So a lot of police are, are really prospering in this time and, and mm. finding that they're really enjoying the job and it's um, very fulfilling. Is this the kind of thing that you're trained in at training school, this kind of emer emergency or aftermath? Well, well we, um, I don't remember any earthquake training. Um, I don't think can tra anyone can mm. be trained for that. Mm. Um, but certainly it, it's dealing with a crisis, dealing with um, people who are upset in an emergency situation. Mm. It's something we have training in. It, it, it's something that um, we have experience in, probably on a smaller scale. Um, but when you have a, a larger scale like this, um, the, the, the training we have, we have had kicks in and um, we've actually done a remarkably good job. What's the mood out on the street now? I mean, after February, I mean, and then after the June aftershocks, what's it out like out there now? Well, you, you, can, you can detect almost an element of despair, you could say, in many people, mm. because it's just, when is this going to stop? Mm -hmm. But there's also a very strong, um, we'll get through this, um, flavour out there, um, mm. resilience you'd call it. Mm. Um, people um, want to show that they can keep going and they will keep going and, and we will work together to, go to, uh, to get through this and really we, we have no alternative. Mm. Alright, Derek, really good to have you on the programme today. My pleasure. Now I'd like to welcome Mark Christensen who has a big job on his hands. Now what's the latest update with Water and Waste? Oh, well, we're making um, steady progress on, on all fronts, so uh, we have uh, water back to everyone in the city and um, there's still the uh, odd house where we're um, just finalising reconnection, but I think uh, that they're, they're almost all done now, so you know, it's excellent progress by um, the city's contractors and repair crews. Uh, we're working on the, uh, still on the water side, on the um, well fields, so refurbishing wells and uh, getting a, as many of those back online as, as fast as we can. And uh, on our reservoirs on the hills, there's repairs going on on the reservoirs on the hills as well. So there's a whole lot of work in the water field that's uh, ongoing and, mm -hmm. and will we'll continue so for, for some time. Okay. Uh, on top of those uh, initial burst repairs, we're also in the process of starting to replace some of the uh, water mains that have just got too many patches on them. So uh, that, that work will continue probably over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, that's a longer term um, repair, which brings the network back to its condition pre 4th of September, which seems a, a long time ago now. Sure does. <laughs> well, it's almost a year. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 And on the um, uh, wastewater side, uh, more challenging. Uh, our focus is on getting people off chemical toilets on the east side of the city and, and getting service back to everyone and, and getting you know people off portaloos as well. Mm. Uh, we're gradually reducing the number of portaloos around the city as, as we re-release -re areas. Obviously the um, June 13 earthquake was a setback. Uh, you know we were making good progress in, in the east and, and reducing people on chemical toilets and then we went almost back to uh, square one again. Mm. So. Uh, the jetting crews have been out there again, cleaning the same pipes out, some, some of them for the third or fourth time, oh uh, which is a bit demoralising for the teams, but they're um, you know, showing a lot of tenacity and sticking at it, and, uh, and we're ma making good, steady progress there now. OK. So, in regard with water, drinking water, everyone has drinking water? Yes, the, the, uh, the, the drinking water, um, as, as it always does, is, is um, thoroughly tested mm -hmm. uh, and monitored by the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Ministry of Health lifted the boil water notice about a week after uh, the 13th of June quake, it was mm. a bit less than a week, mm. um, you know, they're, they're confident that the water's safe to drink at that point in time. And, right. and all, the, all the testing that we did on the water shows that and continues to show that. Uh, the chlorination of the... Um, 
eastern side of the city unfortunately needs to continue mm -hmm. uh, and, and will continue until um, you know we uh, uh, complete a lot of repairs on the major sewer lines and, and greatly reduce the overflows into the rivers mm -hmm. uh, and when we get to that point um, you know the Ministry of Health uh, will be in further discussion with us when we can start to withdraw the chlorination so you know, I want to be quite clear it's mm. the city's intention to withdraw the chlorination but we've just got to be sensible at what point we do that. All right after June 13 when um, you know we had to boil our water again was the water contaminated? Um, the, uh, the, the results that we got through that uh, week period were uh, good, mm. um, but you just can't afford to take the risk. Mm. So um, you know, it's uh, I know it's an inconvenience for people, mm. uh, but it's far better than that uh, in a situation like that um, than have create another uh, medical problem on top of uh, mm. you know an already stressful situation. Mm. So for the inconvenience of a week, it, it just gave everyone the comfort that uh, the water was safe. Um, we, we got the repairs uh, done around the network and, and built the pressure back up in the network and that gives um, you know, the Ministry of Health people and the chlorination system obviously having that in place was a, a big factor in being able to lift the boil water notice quickly. Okay, now let's look at um, the zones in Christchurch now. Yep. Does that make your job easier knowing which areas, say for example the red zone, that's not going to be, you know, we can't use that anymore. Does that make your job easier knowing which ones to focus on, which areas to focus on? Uh, in the medium to long term it does. Um, because we, um, we we won't be renewing assets in those areas. You know, it just doesn't make any sense to go and spend millions of dollars renewing mm. water pipe and sewer pipe in those areas when, um, you know, the, the housing's going to be withdrawn from those areas and there won't be a need for those services. Uh, in the short term, it doesn't because, you know, we need to get services to those people, restore services mm. to those people and provide that services to those people until they make their decisions on, you know, their own individual cases. Okay. And then having the capacity in the city for those people to move elsewhere so that we can start to isolate and shut down the, the networks in those areas. So yes, in the medium term, it, you know, it will help. In the short term, it hasn't made much difference. We're, we're still out there uh, trying to provide service to those areas. OK. Let's look at the areas in Christchurch where people still cannot flush their toilets yep. and, you know, where the chemical loos and portal loos are. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the council is uh, producing a map which we put on our website and, and, and it's released to the media every couple of weeks mm -hmm. which gives an update on um, you know the green and red, there's a lot of red zones mm. <laughs> in the city at the moment, but yeah. um, to differentiate between uh, streets where, and, and even blocks of houses where we need them to keep using their chemical toilet or, or portaloo. Uh, that area is uh, shrinking week by week, um, so I, I think we're we're probably released by the end of this week, probably over 20,000 again now. So we're sort of back to where we were June 13th. Um, and by the 31st of August, uh, we're still hoping to have all the city off um, port loose and chemical toilets. Uh, we're 95% confident on that. That's a target date. End of date. August? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't want to be hung for that, but uh, right. it's a target date for our teams, and, um, you know, they're, they're really brought into that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're, I'm pretty confident they'll get there. How are you boosting the morale within, within your team, especially after June 13, when everything seemed to be going well and on track? Um, well, you know, the, uh, they're a pretty tough bunch in the uh, water and wastewater industry. Mm. So, um, and, and, you know, people who work in essential services uh, all the time, you know, often pretty selfless. Uh, you know, I've got staff who have got houses that are a pile of rubble and those sort of issues. So, um, yeah, they, there's just a commitment there. Yeah, and they're out there helping everybody else. That's mm. amazing. Now, with the um, with it being winter, how is it? Like we've got the, the frozen pipes and, and the rain. Is that is that becoming quite an issue? Uh, we we we've been lucky that the winter's been quite mild to mm. date, um, and the uh, we I haven't heard too many issues about about frozen pipes, but it mm. is a, a possibility, and we have had to. Um, lay some water lines uh, on the surface to get um, surface back quickly to some areas, particularly around Horseshoe Lake and, and in Bexley. Um, we are covering those lines uh, with earth to you know, give them some insulation to, to try and protect them and to protect them from general damage. Mm. Um, that's just a short term um, fix until, until the people in those areas, they tend to be in the red zone, so those, those repairs, so uh, they're, they're a short term fix until the people decide what they're going to do with, with their individual 
situations. All right, Mac, thanks for coming on the programme. No Seeing your regards to your team, they're doing a really good job for our yeah. city. If I could just add on the, uh, there's a lot of interest uh, from recreation users on the waterways. Um, we're equally focused on, on cleaning up the waterways. Uh, we're hoping by the 31st of August to have about uh, 10 kilometres of new pressure mains, uh, sewer pressure mains in place. That will go a long way to removing a lot of the overflows into the waterways, not all of them. Um, mm -hmm. um, but hopefully by uh, sort of early December, maybe a little bit earlier, we, we, we would hope that we will have the water, um, the recreational water back to a, a standard where it can be used. Uh, that's all uh, contingent, of course, on no more earthquakes. Yeah, all right. I'm sure lots of people in the city will be very happy about yeah. that. Thanks very much. Thanks again, Mark. OK. We'll be back after this break. You're back with City Life, and I'd like to welcome Scylla, who has just helped Kiwis receive about $75 million of unclaimed tax and has just been named the Her Businesswoman of the Year. Welcome to City Life. Thank you. Now, tell me about this business you've created. Uh, we do wage, uh, for wage and salary earners, we do tax refunds for them. Lots of people have overpaid their tax over the last five years, um, and we help them get that back from the IRD. Where did this idea come from? Um, from... I've got an accounting practice as well and we were noticing that the children of some of our clients were entitled to refunds that they weren't getting because they weren't tied up with the business and then we developed it further from that. We've put in some automation to, you know, to, so that we now have the 60 second response when you apply um, and it's worked from there. So we've got a lot of very happy Kiwis. So surely the IRD should have been doing this for us to let us know if we had any tax left over? No, their job is to collect tax. Um, and, and, they, and they do that, and that's fine. Um, it's up to the individual to claim what's theirs that they've overpaid back. And we're just making sure that in the years that you've overpaid your tax that you actually get that back. $75 million is a lot it's, of unclaimed money. Yeah, and that's just a portion of what's there. There's a, there's a lot more. Um, wow. So there's a, there's a lot of money, and it's helped the economy, which is great. Good. Now... How do I find out if I've got some unclaimed tax? Well, you apply online on our website. <laughs> yeah. I do love your iPad, by the way. Purple, my favourite colour. <laughs> Absolutely, it's great. And it's, your pen. Yes, you think pink pen. <laughs> Very good at branding. Yes, you are. Um, so you apply on our website, www.nztaxrefunds.co.nz, um, and put, you need your driver's licence and your IRD number, and we will ask you some questions. Um, push submit and in 60 seconds you'll have a response. It, um, it may be that we've, um, that we've calculated the refund or it may be that we require some more information from you that you didn't provide. You know, you might have forgotten that you had children or those sort of things. So <laughs> we do need those details. How <laughs> absolutely incredible. Yeah, no, 60 really seconds. Mm, That's yes. amazing. It is. So do we have to pay for the service? Yes, we do. We take a percentage of the refund. But if there's no refund, there's no fee. So it's a win-win. Either we give you money or we give you nothing, in which case you don't need to pay. Us. That's amazing. Now, these are stands in the malls, I think I've seen. Would that no, be right? No, They're not door-to-door? Door? No, we don't do door-to-door. Door. Really? Website. Who are these people? Who are your website? <laughs> no, no, we do the, the website. So everybody just goes to the website. Um, and we do come into businesses. When, oh, okay. You know, so if anybody's got a business that or staff, I mean, at the moment it's very difficult to give um, pay rises, etc. So this is a way of giving extra money to your staff. Mm. So we come in and, and look after all the staff. One business in Christchurch we went into, only a few staff, um, about 15 staff. $25,000 went back into there. Wow. So there's a lot of money. So it's really, and, and of course the staff really appreciate the fact that their employer's looking after them. That's amazing, isn't it? Mm. Now tell me about the Her Businesswoman of the Year Awards. This wasn't the only award you won. You won no. some other awards first. Tell me about those. Um, we won the Most Innovative Idea and Best Use of Technology. Um, we've also this year, we're finalists in the New Zealand High Tech Awards. So wow. um, it's it's been a really good year. Yeah, it has been. <laughs> really good for the team. It's a great reflection. It's amazing that no one else in New Zealand had come up with this idea. Um, there are others who have now followed. Um, that's a compliment that, that ah, you yes. always take. Um, yeah. But nobody uh, else is doing the 60-second turnaround, um, which is great. What so. is it about your software that makes it so fast? Um, we just went to the best when we needed software. We went to Jolly Good Software, which is Sir Gil Simpson, one of Canterbury's great high-flying Kiwis. Yes. Um, and he listened and he went away and they came back with something that's just amazing. Yeah. We keep developing it. We now have an in-house software team um, so that you know, we're always out there leading the field, doing what we can, um, which is great. So has this gone from a one-woman business to something 
from, so much bigger? We started with three staff. Um, right. We now have just, we sip, but it's quite seasonal, so we sit between 20 and 30 staff, but we're, we are automated. So That is incredible. Mm. So it's you're really from good. Christchurch? Yes, proudly. Yeah. How's, how's, um, the, how have the earthquakes been going with your business? Uh, we're really, really fortunate that our staff are fine, um, that we haven't, well, and their families are fine, so that's great. Um, we've, one of our staff members, her husband's a fireman, so that's been really stressful, and, yeah. and I know they're struggling a lot with that, and lost the house for the liquefaction. Mm. Um, work, we have liquefaction through the building. We've, um, you know, we were kind of wearing gumboots for the first week because wow. we're online nationwide. We had to keep working. Of course. In fact, one of our employees actually went straight back in afterwards to make sure the banking had gone through so that everybody got their refunds that day they were entitled. So that wow, was pretty amazing. Wow, that's dedication, isn't it? Mm, the only, yeah. We'd bought a new building to move into. Um, unfortunately, it's been more damaged than the building wow. we're actually in, so there's a bit of a delay. So we're, we're a little bit squashy in the building, but yeah. that's OK. We, so, yeah. we all get on really well. There's <laughs> definitely the challenges in Christchurch right now. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there so is. what kind of um, you know, relationship do you have with the IRD? Um, fairly good relationship, actually, but we've worked hard to establish that. We're a creditable, creditable business. Um, um, we know they know that we're there genuinely to help people get what they are rightfully owed, mm. um, and that they work really well with us, which is great. Um, they, they, you know, we discuss with them what we're doing with the software and, and what you know how else we can work with them, you know, so that their software is not conflicting with each other, which mm. is really really good. So they've been amazing. I've got to ask, what is it like? Some days you think I actually can't believe I came up with this idea. Do you ever feel like that? Um, Yes, I guess I do. Um, my children seem to. I've got some three daughters who are uh, 20 to 25, and they they will mention that more. I'm just really focused on well, let's do what we can and let's do it better. And and yeah. and how do we help our clients? How do we make the customer journey as smooth and and as enjoyable for everybody? Yeah. That's, that's the focus more than anything else. Yeah, all right. I'm actually really keen to go online as soon as the program's finished. Good. NZ tax refunds. Dot co dot NZ. Yes, that's right. Sella, really good to have you on the program today. Thank and you for having me. Congratulations. Thank you. It's very, great. very good. After the break, we catch up with the Christchurch Arts Festival. Welcome back to City Life. Now, it seems to be festival season, which is a great thing about our city right now. Now, Philip, tell me about the one that you're organising, the one that was launched last night. Oh, it's a, it's a, been really exciting putting this festival together because we started off with a very different sort of festival. Initially, it was a festival that was going to be in the main venues in the centre of the city. And we, of course, after the earthquake, we had to rethink all of that. Mm. And now it's a festival that happens partly in the Events Village, which is going to be in Hadley Park, and also in venues all around town. We're going to, we're taking the ballet company to Villa Maria, we're taking a show, Come On Black, to Aranui and out to Akaroa. Uh, we're taking a Richard Till dinner out to Nahawe Farm Marae. We're going all <laughs> over town. It's going to be great. Well, that and we've good. got a lot of music, we've got a lot of theatre, we've got dance, we've got visual arts, we've got a big photography exhibition that'll be outside, open air, open 24 hours a day. So a lot of different things. Now, other than changing the venues, what else have you had to change because of the earthquakes? We had to cancel one or two big shows that fitted into those big venues, you know, that only worked in those big venues. We've uh, we were already planning a festival that was drawing a lot on New Zealand and on Christchurch. So that was already in the pipeline. Mm. So in fact, we just had to reformat a little bit. Mm. We also had to change, instead of running it over 18, 20 days, jam-packed days, mm. we cut it uh, into weekends. We said, let's focus over a series of weekends because of the facilities and also because of audiences. Mm. People actually don't want to go out every night of the mm. week. It's too hard travelling. So mm. we said, let's do it over eight weekends. So every weekend for eight weekends, you can pick a theatre show, music, and oh, enjoy. It just sounds amazing. Mm. Now, these changes, do you think that will mean anything to the people coming along to the events? I think people coming along to the events are going to get a really good charge up. It's going to, the festival kicks off on the 12th of August, so it's getting towards the end of winter. It's going to be a difficult winter. We mm. know that already. Mm. Um, and it's a chance to just warm up the heart a little bit, mm. to kick up the heels a little bit. Now, let's look at some of the events that, that aren't coming to Christchurch. 
because of the earthquakes, the ones you've had to cancel? Well, there's only one major one, which is the big show, Soap, which is going elsewhere in the country. OK. Um, and, OK, that would have been nice to, would have, been nice to have, mm. but, hey, we're going to have a pretty good time without it. Let's look at who will be at the, the festival. We've got everyone. We kick off with Liam Finn. He's got a couple of gigs in the uh, Festival Club, Telstra Clear Club in Hagley Park. Very that's talented be, man. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be our main music venue. We've got a Brazilian singer coming in there soon after. We've got Phoenix Foundation coming there. We've got a whole host of fantastic music. We're going to finish there with a lovely gig called Songs to Leave Behind, which is going to be Anna Coddington, uh, Julia Deans and Don McGlashan. And they're going to each sing the song that, the song that turned them on to music, the song that they covet the most, that they wish they'd written, and they're going to finish with the song that they'd like to leave behind. If they, you know, it's about mortality. Mm. What's the song they want to be remembered by? It's going to be a beautiful gig, that one. Yeah. There's a lot of it. There's a lot of other shows I could talk about. Fathers and Sons, Electric Wire Hustle. They're a fantastic band. And they're a band, one of them has a mother who's a traditional Vietnamese singer. One of them has a father who's a Congolese drummer. And the other one has a father who's a Maori blues musician. And wow. we're going to get a mini Womad in one concert. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wonderful gigs. That sounds yeah. awesome. Now, why did you choose these artists to form the Christchurch Arts Festival? A lot of the artists we've picked have a link with Christchurch. Mm. So another person we're bringing, for instance, is Mike Nock, who's the top jazz musician in Australia and New Zealand. He's a fantastic uh, pianist and he's bringing his, his trio from... He's currently living in Sydney. He was born in Christchurch. He then went on to have his childhood in Narawahia. He ended up playing a lot in New York with all the big names and jazz and now he's coming back to his hometown. So when it comes to organising an event this big, I mean, you've got eight weekends yeah. of events, where do you start? Do you, I guess venues. <laughs> you start with sorting out the venues, yeah. you start with sorting out the acts, you start with a really good staff. Mm. And the staff is the key for any, of anything like this, as you know. Yeah. So you find people who are really good at, at this sort of work. And there's a lot of specialists now in festivals. How important is this festival going to be for Christchurch? I think it's a real, uh, I think it's a real opportunity for Christchurch to have something on again. Mm. You know, there's been so little happening in this town. Um, and there's, because there's been no venues, there's been no opportunity, and I think it's a real chance now for people to enjoy. Now, where do we get the full programme? It was launched last night. Where can we find out more? It, it's out in the press this morning, so anybody who got a copy of the press delivered on their driveway this morning will find a copy of the programme brochure wrapped up inside it. <laughs> uh, it'll be out in the libraries, it'll be out in the coffee bars, it's online, you can look at www.artsfestival.co.nz. Um, and you, you can give us a call and we'll send you out a copy. I can't wait. Yeah. 12th of August, is it? 12th of August, we kick off. Excellent. Philip, really good to have you on the programme. Thank you very much indeed. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to City Life. Now, as we all know, on February's quake, PGC buildings collapsed. And one of those companies in the PGC building is Perpetual. Patrick, welcome to the programme. Thanks very much. And tell me about how your, your company was affected with the earthquake. So well, we were affected quite dramatically. Uh, we had 29 people on the uh, building that day, of which uh, 10 were killed. Uh, and we uh, subsequently ended up with 11 in hospital. And uh, as of today, we still have uh, one of our colleagues in hospital. An awful time for your staff. Look, it's been a, a very tough time, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, a lot of tragedy to deal with. Uh, a lot of colleagues that they've had injured, and uh, and then a lot of them having to deal with uh, things in their personal life. You know, their houses destroyed and things as well. So it mm. has it's been a very tough time. So how have you been dealing with this as as a group? I suppose. Look, uh, the resilience of people has actually been quite outstanding. Um, what they've done is, is really supported each other as, as much as possible. Mm. Uh, and uh, on top of that, as, as an organisation, we've provided counselling services, we've worked with ACC. Um, and look, I every day hopefully gets better, um, but you know, we've had a number of aftershocks down here recently, and, mm. and that certainly takes people back with it uh, a little bit in terms of how they feel about the environment here. How challenging is this kind of dramatic um, event for a company like yours? Look, it, it's a major. Uh, when you think about it, uh, we had 20% of our workforce uh, were uh, 
you know, killed as a result of the earthquake. It's interesting, um, things like your systems and your IT, they're, they're the easy part uh, to get back. So, you know, client records, uh, mm. all of those sorts of things are scanned these days. Mm. But actually it's the human side, uh, which is, is, the, is the tough part. Mm. Uh, and that's a much longer journey. And I think when people are having to deal with what they, they've gone through, you know, a number of them were trapped anywhere from the time of the quake up to 22 hours. Mm. Um, and so having to deal with that, um, having to think about, you know, can they come back to work when they can come back to work are all personal challenges that they have to deal with. And then we have to measure that up in terms of you know, backfilling some positions and getting contractors mm. and keeping the business going. How are the staff now? How are they coping? Um, look, you know, they are all dealing with it in different ways. Um, we, we still have some of them um, uh, working uh, part time, um, you know, that uh, as a result of, of particularly those that were trapped, um, the trauma of that is, is meaning that you know sometimes they're doing sort of two to five five hours a day, um, and we've just got to work with them in ACC pro to progressively get them back on board. Okay, and where are you working now? We're working over two sites at the moment, uh, Waterloo Road and uh, Lincoln Road, and hopefully by the end of July uh, we'll have all of our team in uh, one roof in uh, Lincoln Road. Good, OK. So what has the quake meant for investors? In terms of investors, um, I mean, there's sort of two types. If you've been in property investment, particularly in Christchurch, you know, it's probably been a very interesting time. But if you've just been investing in broader portfolios, um, diversified assets, both in New Zealand and Australia, um, it's just been part of normal markets. OK. And what measures can be taken to sort of make things a bit better? Well, look, it's interesting. I think there's two sides. I, I think uh, to make things better, one of the things that we've certainly learnt in talking with our clients is in their personal affairs. Um, you know, have they got a will in place? Mm. Uh, you know, are they adequately insured? Um, both personally and I think also um, what people have learnt out of this is actually to, to check you know, your household contents and your house insurance and those, that, that sort of side of things. Mm. And I think the other side in terms of their investments is you know, people are having to uh, now reflect uh, in terms of uh, have their circumstances changed, are they going to need some of their capital, um, is their extended family needing assistance. So mm. it's not a case by case situation but certainly that they are having to think of those things. Yeah, so are more people taking money out of their investments? Look, we're not seeing that at this stage um, and I think there's uh, people have been waiting to see what the government are going to be doing, uh, mm. particularly around if their, their houses are, are red stickered mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's now clearer um, you know, people will obviously get some get some money. Uh, they need to think about obviously what they do with that in the mm. short term and, and where they go and what they do. But we're certainly not seeing people you know, rushing in and wanting their money. Do you think that trend might change? Um, look, I think it depends uh, a lot on individual circumstances with their families, mm -hmm. whether they're, they're wanting to support them mm. uh, and whether they are looking to relocate themselves, uh, whether they need to, to, to utilise that capital. With events such as these, how can people protect themselves? Look, it's um, it's it's the, look. That's a really interesting question. I think it's look. It goes back to the basics in terms of people looking after their money. They need to see a good financial advisor, mm. put a plan in place, uh, review it annually, uh, so that they make sure that their their money is doing what they want to do. Mm. And I think in terms of their 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 wider situation. Again, it's making sure that you've got yourself adequately protected. I think, uh, unfortunately, in New Zealand, we're, we're very we're very underinsured, okay. uh, and, and a lot of the time we expect to rely on the government. And I think this has probably been a big wake up call uh, for people that actually you need to take care of your affairs. You need to look at them regularly. We're very good at doing something and putting it in the top drawer and forgetting about it as well. Mm, in terms of um, the last six months, what have what's the impacts and observations that you've seen? Um, look, the observations that I've seen, uh, and I look, I've spent a lot of time down in Christchurch, uh, is that I think that, um, look, on the business front, uh, I think those that have been in the retail side, it's been very hard. Those like ours that are in the service industry, it's just been dealing with clients on the ground, making sure that they uh, are well communicated with and, and we're dealing with them uh, and, and reassuring them that obviously we, we can assist them uh, where they need. Mm. All right. Patrick, really good to have you on the programme. Send Thank our regards you. to your team. Will do. Thanks. Now I'd like to welcome Mark from the Union Parish Church in New Brighton. Now I've read that your church, which is the oldest in New Brighton, is about to be demolished. That's right. It's been a bit of a journey since February and um, 
to begin with it was only going to be repaired but June 13th quakes have damaged it a lot more and the insurance company is now telling us it's definitely a write-off so mm. it's going to come down sometime soon we're not sure when. So the steeple had already fallen off or is that still... The steeple was teetering yeah. in February right. and the City Council rescued it a day or two following the big quake and it's sitting next to the building on the ground mm -hmm. and that's quite significant because that was a new steeple, only a couple of years old mm. and the New Brighton community did a lot of fundraising because they said they really thought that steeple was an important part of New Brighton. Mm. A lot of people took their bearings from the steeple. It was the highest point okay. in, the, in the village. And so um, that will be part of the future. We don't know what that is yet, but the steeple we will still have, and it'll have probably even more significance now. OK. Mm. So with the demolish... Um, demolishing of the church, what does this mean for the community in New Brighton? Well, it means the end of a lot of history. A lot of people in New Brighton, because it's quite an old community, New Brighton, uh, a lot of people telling me stories as I meet them on the street and in different places that uh, they went to girl guides there mm. or they had girl guide parades there or they got married there, or they had baptisms there, or their f family had funerals there. Mm. So it's been a significant place in the life of New Brighton. And at some point soon we will have a goodbye to the building okay. and, um, and honour those memories. Yeah. Mm. You had only been in the job for three weeks when That's the right. earthquake happened. What's this like for you? Uh, Life-changing. It's totally changed the way I do ministry. It's changed the way I see the church. Um, and there's been huge challenges, of course, mm -hmm. in this ongoing experience, um, working with people who've been terribly affected by the earthquake in mm -hmm. a variety of ways, um, the impact it's had on community life. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an adventure mm -hmm. and we see lots of opportunities and new possibilities out of this experience. And so I've been saying to people, I need a new challenge. Well, I've got it. Yes. And it's, I feel like I'm in the right place at the right time. Now, you say it's changed the way that you do ministry and changed mm -hmm. the way that you see the church. I mean, there's so many churches across the city yep. have crumbled down. Yes. So, I mean, I guess it's just not about the church, is it? Where are people going now? Where are they going? Yeah, because they can't meet at the churches that are crumbled down. No, they can't. What we're doing is, well, the first Sunday we met on the beach. It was a beautiful day, mm. and that was quite a nurturing thing for our people. Mm. And then we arranged to hold our Sunday gatherings and services in a local cafe. Oh, really? Which is what we did. And it was... Fantastic. We did that for about seven weeks mm. and we got a new sense of ourselves and a new way of doing things. Mm. And so when the green sticker went on our hall and we had power again and so on, because those services took a long time to come back, we meet now in our hall on Sunday, mm. but we do it in a different way. We're cafe style mm. every Sunday. Mm -hmm. It's very interactive, very participatory, a lot of sharing. Mm. And um, I do far less talking on Sundays now than I ever used to do. And it's good. absolutely brilliant. <laughs> so it's good. It shows that it's not about the building, but it's more about the fellowship and the sort of the relationship absolutely. with people, isn't it? One of the things we keep telling ourselves every week as the church is not the building, it's the people. Mm. And for us, that's not just who comes on Sunday either, it's the whole community. Mm. And so that's why we are moving on and we're, we're thinking differently. I mean, I used to spend a lot of time sitting in my office, carefully preparing things. Mm -hmm. I spend about two hours a week in an office now, which <laughs> is a porticom. <laughs> 
next to our damaged building. Mm. I spend a lot of time with a cell phone, a laptop, um, interacting with people on site, mm. in the neighbourhood, in cafes, in the local library, in the mall. Mm. Uh, that's what, it's changed the way I do ministry mm. and I feel like in five months my relationships with people in the community, in the parish, it would have taken me five to ten years mm. to do, and it's all happened in five months. It's been so intense, but extremely rich, mm. and um, it's opened up a whole new way of seeing things. Now tell me finally about this visioning event this weekend. Sure. When the, big, when the broken building comes down, there's going to be a big empty space. Mm with a steeple just sitting there. <laughs> Our sense is that the right thing to do is to have an event where we invite the whole New Brighton community to join with us and vision a new future for this site, a future that benefits the whole community. Let's do it together. Instead of the old days where the church works out what it thinks is good for the community, mm. We're saying we need to listen what's good for the community mm. and for us all. And then we'll, we'll build a vision together and we'll move on together. So this right. is the church at the heart of the community, but being guided by the community as to what is good for the community here. All right, so that's Saturday 10 till 2. Mark, really good to have you on the programme today. Thank you, Kanita. We'll be back after this break where we chat about Māori Language Week. You're back with City Life and I'd like to welcome to the programme Paula and Sheree as part of Māori Language Week. Good to have you here. Oh, kia ora. And tell me about your involvement with the week. Well, it's every week's the same basically for us in our daily job. We speak Māori every day on the air. Um, I guess the difference for this week out of the year is um, everybody in the country gets on board and helped out with speaking it on, on news channels, on TV programs, everywhere you go, you are kind of bombarded with the language, which is great, mm. which is a really good thing from back in the day. Um, and yeah, that's our daily kind of style. We speak Māori every day on the radio. Great. And um, we also sing as well. Now, you are both DJs on Tahu FM. You work together on the program? Yeah. Yeah? Been together for about eight years. About too long. Have it's you? Been together too long. Eight years this year, I think. So do you speak te reo on, on air all the time? All the time. Um, the difference since the earthquake, um, just getting news items out there so that everyone can understand, we've um, now gone bilingual. Uh, but eventually we'll ch go back to um, speaking Māori 24-7. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a great feeling being able to share, basically, and that's part of the theme for this week, mm. which is manaakitanga, mm. to share, to encourage people to speak a language of the country. Why was it that you went bilingual? Is it because that's your audience, that some of them understand some of the language? Yes. Um, not everyone, uh, na no one's a native speaker unless you're from the... You know, you've been immersed in it for so many years. So to capture the whole audience that we have, we needed to change, to switch to bilingual so that everyone could understand what we were going on about. Paolo, when, you, when did you learn to speak Māori? I uh, started learning te reo in, at Kohanga when I was about a year or two old. Really? And I was just, and straight from there I went to Kura Kaupapa and yeah, that's been me ever since Kohanga, preschool. Wow. So do you speak it all the time, like when you're, you do on air, when you're at work? What about, you know, when, you, when you're out socialising with friends? Yeah, oh yeah now and then I'll, like, I have a chat in Māori to friends and stuff, and definitely at Kapahaka, we always talk Māori there. So yeah, I took maybe like from the day, probably about 40, 50% of the day I talk Māori. Oh, that's right. So not really at home, my mother doesn't really speak Māori anymore. Okay. Yeah. She used to speak it? Yeah, when I was at Kuanga, she was there helping out, teaching and stuff. Okay. But it's kind of died off now, so it's right. just me. All right, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Shuri, what about you? How long have you been speaking today? Um, since I, I haven't been speaking for very long, I'm a second language learner. Um, 
when I was growing up, I was immersed in kapahaka, so I wanted to know what the hell I was singing about. Mm. And so that gave me, that was a bit of motivation for me to learn what I was singing about and to, I guess, to capture that audience and to make them know that I understand, to let them know that I actually understand what I'm singing about. Mm. So that was very much my motivation to speak Māori. And you got a job out of it. I did, I did. <laughs> I've, I've gotten a job, I've gotten different gigs from singing as yeah. well in the background. And um, yeah, it's, it's taken me a, a long way. It's given me a massive journey. Yeah, definitely. Now tell me about this prop that he, you have brought. It's not just a prop. Tell me what this is. Well, this is what they call a, let me guess, <laughs> let me say, toki po tangata. Um, I've never actually, I don't actually know much about taonga, but um, I know that this was, you sometimes you'd use it to make different... Different whare and different stuff. Different whare, different um, houses, buildings. Mm -hmm. Um, also, they have some as weapons as well, right. but I'm not too sure if this is actually a weapon. Gosh. But to me, it looks like a tool you'd use for building. Yeah. Wow. Look at that detail. It's incredible, isn't it? So, um, it's good to see you've got a guitar here. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, hearing a little bit of music. First time here on City Life, so I'm very Great. excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have an album. I do. We just released it in Waitangi Weekend. It was a whole uh, collaboration, so it wasn't just myself, it was a team effort. And it talks about the different, um, I guess, experiences that everyone in the world is experiencing at the moment. Mm. So it takes a look at uh, the four different elements we have, like water, fire, wind, and what was the other one? Water, fire, wind, earth. And um, I take these different elements and put them into songs even though you don't know the um what i'm talking about you'll definitely get the feel from the beats so you've got four different genres um four elements talking about four different topics so it's a massive thing that we've tied into the whole album and it's called kōkōpū and you can get it on itunes as well cool now was it significant to um, release it on waitangi weekends it was it was a good um kind of idea to release it on the day that of, is of significance. Mm. Um, and we shot a, flew over to the Gold Coast to celebrate Waitangi Day over there as well. Okay, now we are getting the wind up, but I do want to hear some music, but we, I also want to learn some greetings because it is Māori Language Week. And we had Brett Lee on the program yesterday speaking to us about destinationreo.com. I thought it was .co.nz, but it turns out it's .com. Um, and there's a 12-week challenge on there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, before there was a 12-week challenge um, prior to that destination video that we were involved with. And I have to say, as someone who speaks Māori, it was challenging. So I, wow. I guess <laughs> everyone, have a go at it. Have a go at the 12-week challenge. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to try. There was one year where you had to use greetings, so um, that's day one or week one. Now let's learn some a few greetings, and then we'll listen to some. We'll hear some music. Okay, so everybody knows Kilda. Kilda. Um, if you were to ask someone to come in to enter into your office, into mm -hmm. your house, you'd say. Kuhu mai. Or. Tauti mai. Or. Haru mai. Oh really? <laughs> there's a lot so of ways you whole, can say it. Say them a lot again. Of different kupu. There's a uh, tauti mai. Tauti mai. There's kuhu mai. Kuhu mai. And there's haru mai. Haremai. So that means welcome, enter. To enter. Just gives you a variety of different ways to say That's it. my word for the day. Oh, kukumai. Yeah. Kuhumai. Kuhumai. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Awesome. Right, let's hear some beautiful music. I heard you playing before and I was like, oh, I can have a lot of that. <laughs> I can hear a lot of it. Uh, this song is about um, standing as one, um, having that one voice, stand as one, be as one, and sing as one. Awesome. Tonight, I'm going to 
there. Ko te ite tu. Wow, what a voice. And sitting down, singing those high notes. Uh, very hard, but yeah. you learn that in kapahaka. Yeah, oh, that was really beautiful. Thank you. Shri and Paura, thank you so much for coming on the program. Really good to have you here, and thanks for teaching me some of those words. Kia ora. <laughs> Program, I'd like to welcome our first flautist, Tamara Smith. Good to have you here. Thanks for letting me be here. Now, yeah. you, you're just about to launch your CD. Tell me about this. Well, um, yes, the CD was recorded almost a year ago in, in Manuka Bay, where my brother Tyson and I grew up, um, which is about an hour and a half north of um, Christchurch. And we did five days of recording in a shed, which um, was sort of converted into sort of a artist space and yeah it's been a long journey to, to do it but um, initially it was going to be at the Harbour Light Theatre in April and then mm -hmm. with the demise of the Harbour Light and then we moved it to the Loons and then that was um, yellow stickered of course about two weeks ago after the June quake. Oh I didn't know that. So um, yeah so this is the third venue so third, third time lucky as we say. So yeah. yeah so, so where is it this time? It's at um, Naval Point Yacht Club in um, Magazine Bay so it's just a right from the tunnel and towards the marina there. Ah, oh, that'd, be, that'd be a cool venue. Yeah, I was lapping water right on the on the um, place, so it's, yeah, it should yeah. be good. Yeah. Now tell me about the band that has helped put to get this album together. Well, the band is made up of my brother Tyson on guitar and banjo, uh, Jeremy Thin, who plays in CSO and also in Pandemonium, mm -hmm. and he's on yep. Marimba. Uh, there's a guy called Douglas Brush who's recent arrival from Chicago is on world percussion, mm. tabla and stuff. Um, mm. Chris Burke on tenor saxophone. Rosalind Langton's doing some guest vocals. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And who am I saying? Uh, Dougal Kennard on bass. And then we've also got um, opening for us is a Wantanara, which is an African drum and dance ensemble. So <laughs> it's going to be a real celebratory night. Yeah, yeah. A good night to get out in Christchurch. Yeah, 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 totally. So tell me about the, the support band. Um, Wantanara um, would um, D um, Douglas, I would like to call him Doug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he uh, he's come over and he's been he's travelled around the world heavily into African music, mm. and he started up, you know, teaching a lot of us in Christchurch African drums, so the traditional art of African drums. So there's a traditional African drum ensemble, which is often accompanied by live dance, and so culminating in the end of the evening, Mundi is going to combine with Wantanara and I've asked um, a really beautiful dancer, Ra Macrosti, to choreograph a, a dance to go along with that. So it's going to be the sort of interesting contemporary and traditional and then merging together. So, wow, yeah. oh, that sounds awesome. Now is this your first album? No, no, um, this is I guess my third album. I, my first album was with Tyson many years ago, we were called Pangolin as a duo oh. and um, we used to play arts festivals and jazz festivals. Mm. And then the first album was recorded of with Mundi was recorded partly in Sri Lanka, so that was about 2003, 2004. So wow, yeah. Why did you decide to record it there? Um, at the time, a really good friend of mine, uh, who was also the drummer in, Mun in Mundi, he's actually originally from Sri Lanka, and so we went for a three-week tour over there mm. and uh, composed some music to work in with some of the traditional elements of Sri Lankan music. Wow. So yeah, it was that was a really cool experience, and um, yeah, I'm really into, I don't guess you know, world music. Mm. It's been really something that's influenced me a lot. So mm. even though it's all original, it's got quite a lot of elements that I guess are sort of from different world music. So wow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Now tell me how your album has already made an impact in New Zealand, hasn't it? Or was it your your former one with on Kiwi FM and other oh, places yeah, like no, that? Oh yeah, no, this yeah this one. Um, I, I, well, it was a really positive thing. Monkey Records, which is a really uh, well, you know, um, well thought of mm. as a as a record label, um, put this album under our, that record label, and I've had some really awesome reviews. Mm. Lots of them sort of likening it to something that could be definitely on WOMAD and be you know really um, really sort of multicultural kind of album. And then it was Indie Album of the Week a couple of weeks ago on Kiwi FM, wow. and was um, on a show on Global Sounds on Concert FM, so so it's getting, getting some radio play, which is great. And, um, That's awesome. Yeah. Now we had the director of the Christchurch Arts Festival on the program a little bit earlier today. Now you're 
are actually in the arts festival as well. I'm performing um, with Silencio Ensemble. Yeah. Okay. And so they're doing um, some music to accompany a film, I think, called jo Joan of Arc. Oh. So a traditional film. Uh, I think it was originally in the 1940s or something recorded then. So awesome. we're doing some music for that. Okay, tell us again um, about the your gig and where it is. Okay, so Mundi's gig is door sales only, just because we've had to change it the last week. Um, and it's fifteen dollars, but if you want to bring your kids, kids are free. And it's going to start off with Wantanara African Drum and Dance Ensemble and then feature Mundi celebrating all the tunes that are on the album and will also culminate in some dancing and some good times and bar is available. Sounds awesome, Tamara. Really good to have you on the programme today. Thanks very much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> that is City Life for today. Now, CC Magazine is out. Don't forget to pick up yours around Christchurch. You can get in touch with us here at CTV. You can email me, kaneta at ctv.co.nz. You can call us 3777-033 or you can write to us, PO Box 1100 Christchurch. And you can watch CTV City Life on demand. Just go to ctv.co.nz, find the big YouTube logo, click on that and it'll bring up all our past programs. And of course, we're on Facebook, CTV City Life. Thanks for watching. Have a good weekend and I'll see you on Monday.